Hey, Margie here. Are you ready to learn some easy strategies you can use to have more energy, have more focus, improve your bones and overall health, and just be able to live your best life with passion? Well, if so, you are in the right place because our very special guest is Dr. Marisa Snyder. And Dr. Marisa is a functional practitioner women's hormone expert, and the author of eight books, The Essential Oils Menopause Solution, which focuses on solutions for women in menopause and perimenopause, and the national number one best-selling book, The Essential Oils Hormone Solution, which focuses on balancing women's hormones naturally. For the past 15 years, she has lectured at wellness centers, conferences, and corporations on hormone health, metabolic health, nutrition, and detoxification. She has been featured on Dr. Oz, Oprah Magazine, Fox News Health, Mind Body Green, and many publications. Dr. Marisa is also the host of the Essentially Your podcast with over 5 million downloads designed to empower women to live their best life and really to become the CEOs of their health. So today she's going to, we're really focusing on what can be done. And she gives just fabulous tips that I know we can all implement. So stay tuned. Welcome, Dr. Marisa. I'm really happy to have you here because I love the work you do and you have so many practical solutions and, and just great tips that I really think is, are going to help everybody. So welcome. Thanks for having me. You know, I always love to start with the backstory because it's always fascinating to me why why you're so passionate about women's health, women's hormone health, and the work you do. So why don't you just share how you got involved with this area, with this area? Absolutely. I mean, it started, you know, I have a defining moment where I had severe chronic fatigue at 30 years old and I couldn't even get out of bed. I was that, that crippled with fatigue. Um, and I knew that I had, I had to do something different if I was going to have a life where I was functioning like a normal human being. But you, know, as I think about well before that, I think about how, you know, even from as early as high school, I was driven by survival. I was constantly in survival mode. And in order to meet my demands of running at a very fast pace constantly to the point where I wore tennis shoes because I could just walk faster that way. Um, I, I fueled on caffeine and sugar from a very early age to give myself a slight edge so that I can keep running at a very high pace. And so I would say that the majority of my 20s, I was on a perpetual blood sugar roller coaster. And I always wondered why I was so hungry, like hangry, ready to like strangle someone at 11 o'clock in the morning. I was just so hungry. Then at two or 30 in the afternoon, I would completely crash again. I would need to like refuel and then would, you know, would basically be chasing blood sugar crashes pretty much 24 seven for probably over a decade. So by the time I got to 30, I had such, such severe insulin resistance, such severe mitochondrial dysfunction that my body was like, you can't even function in the morning, let alone get through the rest of your day. And that was a really big defining moment for me of like, okay, how do we shift our body to support ourselves in an energetic way? How do we ensure that we've got metabolic flexibility, whether you're 20 or you're 30 or you're 75, like how do we maintain that? And, and, and what is it that we need to do on a daily basis to really support our bodies so that, they, so that we've got the brain function, we've got the energy that we can show up the way that we want to do. And, you know, although stress is a major player here, the, the biggest lesson I learned was really how we ensure that our blood sugar levels are stable throughout the day. And uh, because as a woman who had had no stable blood sugar for a very, very, very long time, I, I know and I see the repercussions of it. You know, the three number, the three signs of us having deregulated blood sugar um, will be that you're hangry. You're just hungry. You're just, and you're not exactly sure why, because you just ate maybe two hours ago or three hours ago. You've got killer cravings. And the third one, probably the biggest one is that you just feel tired. You feel tired in the afternoon. You feel tired after work. You feel, eventually you feel tired in the morning, right when you wake up. And so that was kind of like in all the years that I've been studying women's health, you know, if we could, if we could focus, if I could have just known in my twenties, even in my teens, like, Hey, keep your blood sugar happy, keep your metabolism happy. 
I, I know that I would not have landed with an inability to get up in the morning at 30 years old. And so that is, that is a big part of, of my story is just really identifying, um, you know, what I was doing every single day that was adding up over time to then cause kind of a bigger issue um, that I had to address at 30 years old. You know, it's so interesting because I can completely relate to this story because as a physical therapist in my 20s, I was seeing a zillion patients and I was living on caffeine and I was living, and I also, you know, was a, I'm, a, I'm a recovered sugar addict, so I was living on sugar and the same things, three in the afternoon if I didn't have my caffeine or I didn't. So I definitely, now I know what was happening. But as you're saying that, I'm thinking, oh gosh, that was me. And the truth is that so many people, and they just compensate for it. You know, they just compensate and take other things and really don't realize that there's major repercussions and boy, they could feel so much better. So I'm excited that you're going to share all the good things that people can do. But that's interesting. That's that's how you got started, you know, working on women's hormone health and all these things. So this audience, a lot of people are post-menopause. And, mm -hmm. and so I wanted to, why don't you, you have an interesting definition of menopause. And why don't you share a little bit about some of the things that happened that we can we can really make an impact on? Absolutely. So, you know, menopause, as we define it right now, is 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 the day or the, the time in which it's been a year since you've had a period. Basically, the ovaries are bowing out and they are they are relinquishing energy for other activities. And I think that this is such a great, beautiful transition. It's a transition we're always going to get into. You can, you know, it, it's it's in a lot of ways. It's it's like we're heading into this next new adventure in our lives where we get to reclaim the energy that we leveraged every single month with our menstrual cycle. And now that that we, we bow out of that, that reproductive time that we get to utilize that energy in a different, in a different way. Now it's important to know that there definitely changes are happening with the bow out of those sex hormones. But if we have the ability to really support our metabolic health, support our other hormones, we really get to saunter into this next beautiful phase with energy, grace, and really purpose in what we feel really called to. And, and I think women are really stepping into this in such a beautiful way, um, especially when they do that inquiry of like, what is it that I want to do now? Like, what, who, do, who do I want to become in this next, this next version of me? You know, what, what do I want my life to be filled with? You know, who do I want my life to be filled with? And we get to really re kind of reconnect into who we are and, 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 and the amazing purpose that we're here for. Oh, I love that. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things I do is teach a happiness program. So that just totally shits in with everything I believe. So why don't you share some of your top tips that people listening can do so that they can have that joy and happiness and glide into, and a lot of people are, you know, 10, 20 years, even beyond, but in that stage of life so that they can have that good metabolic health that you were talking about. Absolutely. Well, I think the first step of all of them is the mindset. I think when, just like the happiness course that you just talked about is mindset is everything. We have to believe that we deserve it. We have to believe that our bodies are capable. Uh, and we have to believe that, um, that not only do we deserve it, but that we get to have it. I think that's really important. You get to have that future that you want. You get to, you get to create whatever. You get to become who you want to become. I believe that 100%. But that first step, I, I always think about, um, you know, I was told by a really dear friend of mine that everything's created twice. Everything. The, this cup I'm holding, this computer that we're, we're in right now, um, you know, the, the, all of it. You, someone had to think about it first. Someone had to imagine it. Then... We, those thoughts become inspired action and then the end result, there's, there's the thing, right? And so I think every step of who we want to become or what we want to be doing, that first has got to come from our mind side. It's got to come from our mind of what we want to create. And the more clarity that we can get about who we are and who we want to become, I think it's so, so important. And, and that goes into our health as well. If we want to feel vibrant, if we want to feel energized, it's just getting super clear on, on what that feels like. And then the beautiful thing is, is we can bring in tools to start to make that happen. You know, we know today that we can reverse chronic conditions, that we can reverse chronic state, symptom states. Um, and I'm living proof that that's absolutely possible myself. I've had lots of chronic 
disease states that I've overcome, just having that intention and then, and then having the, the knowledge and the, and the know-how and then applying that to daily activities to really get, to get to that place of that vibrancy, that energy, that really showing up. So that mindset is first and foremost. And then what I've learned and all the things that I've, I've dissected over the years is in one of the biggest and most foundational things that we can do is by the decisions that we make with our fork. You know, we, the, probably the one thing that we do the most consistently besides manage relationships is eat. We're eating, hopefully not all the time, um, but we're definitely eating throughout the day. And it's really about how do we manage that plate? Like, how do we, how do we choose foods that are going to nourish our body? They're going to fuel our cells. They're going to help support our mitochondria, which are the little energy powerhouses in the cell. And so I always think about what is on my plate or what is in my grocery cart that is going to be my future brain? Like what, cause it is, it's, and so you get it aside. Is it, is it going to be cereal? Is cereal my future brain? Or is it like a, you know, a veggie omelet is my future brain or a big robust salad with salmon? Is that my future brain? And so I always come from the mindset of like, what is it, what is it, what's about to become my future brain in three, six months down the line, even years down the line. And so when I think about that, I want to build my plate um, with a ton of fiber. I want my, I want a broccoli brain. I'm actually looking at a bunch of broccoli right now on a plate. I want a, you know, I want a cruciferous veggie brain. I want a blueberry brain. I want raspberries and cherries. You know, I want a lot of the color of the rainbow. I want a diverse polyphenol antioxidant brain with lots of minerals and vitamins. And then also I want, I want a healthy fats brain. So avocado, olive oil, like Mediterranean, you know, walnut seeds, you know, that you've getting that fiber and that healthy fat. And then I want the protein to really support that as well. And so, you know, I love lean, um, lean, lean meats, lean protein sources like fish. I, I just, I just had salmon with broccoli and cherries and a huge salad with cucumbers and all kinds of things. That was lunch for me. And so, you know, I'm building a way in which to support that brain. But also I know that I'm also supporting not only my gut health and my gut microbiota, but also my liver. Um, and the, probably the most important thing that really dictates how I'm going to operate in the day and operate tomorrow and operate next month and, 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 and so on is really ensuring that my blood sugar levels are stable. Again, I spent a big chunk of my life, probably way more than just my teens and my twenties, probably way, I remember being a little girl and eating cornflakes and having a sugar bowl at the center of the table and just dumping sugar into the cornflakes until it was viscous, like until it was sludge, like it, Cornflakes were not worth eating until the sludge was there. You know what I'm saying? And little did I know that the cornflakes on their own were going to spike a blood, going to give me a blood sugar spike. And then think about all the table, the sucrose that I was consuming, like that is like an, like an umpteenth blood sugar spike. So I probably spent a big chunk of, a, a chunk of my life just, uh, just having these big blood sugar spikes and no wonder mood, my mood was not, was all over the place or that I was hangry or that I was lagging in my energy levels. And so today, knowing that and knowing what it feels like to have that energy source um, and knowing what it feels like to have stable blood sugar, I'm always looking at my plate and looking at what I'm eating and asking myself, is this going to stabilize my blood sugar? Is this going to keep, am I going to be in that sweet spot where, you know, no pun intended, <laughs> I'm going to be in that sweet spot where my energy is going to stay consistent. My mood is going to stay consistent. My brain function is going to work properly. Like I'm going to feel like I'm firing on all cylinders because I'm keeping that blood sugar level stable um, throughout the day. And so anytime I'm building a plate or I'm, um, I'm considering what I'm going to eat, it always comes from the standpoint of like, is how, what's my brain going to think about this? <laughs> and what is my blood sugar going to think about this? And, and what I've learned in supporting tens of thousands of women in this, in this experience is that if we can maintain blood sugar and we can help keep our, our brain and our mitochondria happy, gosh, it's, we are, it's literally endless in terms of what we are capable of creating because our body is so well nurtured. So that's always the first step for me is like, how do we dial in the nutrition, make it as simple as possible. Um, and thinking, always thinking about coming from a place of how am I supporting my brain, my future brain? How am I supporting my future energy levels?
Oh, I love that. But a couple things. So where do you think people fall short? What do you find in your practice are the are the areas that people have issues with and don't even realize maybe that they're doing something that isn't good for their brain, isn't good for their mitochondria, you Absolutely. know, that they don't realize. Where do you see when they're putting together their plate that they're, you know, where do you see the most common problems or the most common areas that people aren't addressing? I think a lot of us don't realize, I know I didn't, they don't, we don't realize what is going to trigger a blood sugar spike. We don't realize that the food on our plate is actually going to do that. We don't realize that breakfast, which is the first meal of the day, obviously, it, what we eat for breakfast is going to dictate what happens to our blood sugar and our metabolism for the next 48 hours, not 24 hours, 48 hours. And so a lot of our breakfast in America, even in Europe, I know my husband and I were taking our, our toddler to Italy and breakfast in Italy is coffee and croissants or some type of pastry. What, what people don't realize is that anytime we eat uh, starches, carbs, dessert for breakfast, whether it's cereal, whether it's a muffin, whether it's um, toast and jelly, um, it's, a, it's a fruit smoothie, like I can, the, the list is endless, right? In terms of... Um, it's it's a processed oatmeal in a cup with with brown sugar and and dried fruit. When we eat when we eat these types of foods, these these processed starches and carbs on their own, I call them eating them naked. Um, guaranteed, especially if it's the morning time, it's it's a glass of orange juice with that with that piece of toast, right? That's a guaranteed blood sugar spike. And and what a lot of us don't realize is that. Let's say you you spike up, you know, 30 milligrams per deciliter where more than you were because that's considered a blood sugar spike, that if that's the first thing that happens to you metabolically in the morning, that everything that almost every meal that you have moving forward, whether it is very low in terms of spiking blood sugar or not, it's going to continue to spike you up and up and up. And so that first meal of the day is the most critical meal of the day. And it's often the meal where we are eating dessert for breakfast. We are consuming the processed starches or carbs because that's what we've always been told to do. We we're eat like one of the most, you know, we are always told that oatmeal particularly is heart healthy, it's cholesterol healthy, it's diabetic healthy. But if you eat oatmeal on its own in the morning, you're gonna spike. You are. It's not. It's the opposite of what's gonna happen what 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 they promised <laughs> was going to happen to you and and that oatmeal that little bowl of oatmeal with with milk and maybe a tiny little bit of of um of dried fruit or whatever you put on top of it that's going to set that's going to set the tone for the rest of the day and the next day as well and so i think a lot of us are not even cognizant that we think that there's a lot of safe foods out there um, that when we eat them standalone, they actually are, are causing this metabolic deregulation. And so I've got a lot of, I got five little hacks I want, I would love to share. Oh, and, yes. And, and I just have to say, yeah. so first of all, I have a son who has type one diabetes, so I'm so very well, but this was, I wore, a, a, you know, I wore the, the glucose monitor, the continuous one for two weeks and Oh, exactly what you're saying. It's just so unbelievable and everyone's different, but it, I couldn't agree with you more. Those types of breakfasts, even the, you know, the excess fruit. So yes, please share the hacks with everybody. Oh, totally. I mean, if, even for some, um, even espresso in the morning on its own could potentially, you know, again, there's no sugar in that. It's just water and espresso, but it's, it's always so good to know. Now what I'm going to share these five hacks are universal. You, you all would benefit from them, whether we know you ate oatmeal or not and had a blood spike or not, correct? Like, you know, because there's going to be, everyone's a little bit different, but these are kind of like guaranteed rules that will absolutely change not only your metabolic health, but will absolutely increase your energy levels, will banish those cravings and will banish that feeling of feeling hangry and will have your brain feeling like it is working at top speed. So Okay, one, go ahead, Dr. Marisa. Yeah. It's have a savory breakfast have a savory breakfast that is protein focused. Uh, and what's so great about this, at least this was my, one of my favorite uh, um, habits to adopt, is that we just made more dinner the night before. And I, I'm like, great, I can just do leftovers. I don't have to make anything new. I can just heat whatever I made the night before. And so this one was such an easy one for me because I, we already, food was already made. We just heat up 
the Lamburger or heat up the salmon from the night before, or, you know, whatever it may be. That was my, that was breakfast for me this morning was, was um, five ounces of salmon. That is what I had this morning with, with, with veggies. So protein focused, savory breakfast. So kick out the cereal, kick out the, the muffins and the toasts and all that. Like focus on savory, again, healthy fats, clean, clean, healthy protein, veggies, if you can get it, get, get as much fiber as possible. Um, number two is going to be walking after lunch and dinner, um, at least 15 to 20 minutes. Now, if you can, and you're thinking to yourself like, oh, I can't make lunch and dinner work. If you had to choose when to walk after dinner. If walking after dinner will will stabilize your blue glucose, your blood sugar levels, or prevent a spike by up to 50%. So if you are going to have gelato after dinner, you know, or you're going to have something, walk at the same time. I think that's where the Italians and the French get it right, is that they're walking and doing dessert at the same time. So you're, you're, you, what your muscles are doing is they're taking in that glucose that hits the bloodstream very quickly. And it, they, they can do it without a release in insulin, but you know, so we don't have to have insulin involved at all. We could, your muscles, if they're moving and it doesn't have to be walking, but I personally think walking is the easiest, the best. It feels good. You can walk your dog. You can walk with your partner. It's just a great time to connect as well, but gosh, it is the game changer. Probably one of the most underrated exercises that we can do is walk. Um, so, and I say get in where you fit in, walk all the time, anytime, but especially walk after dinner and you can walk up to an hour and a half to two hours after dinner. Obviously the sooner after dinner in that pros, pros pandial, prandial place, the better, but as long as it's within the two hour window of after you ate, even better. Number three, um, is going to be have dessert after your meal, have dessert after your metabolically healthy meal. So I always recommend a meal being protein, healthy fats, lots of fiber, as much fiber as you can get. We really do need about 50 grams of fiber every single day. And the average American is getting 11 to 12. That's where we're at right now. And so we are desperate for more fiber. Um, so tons of fiber. And then after you've had this robust metabolically healthy meal where protein and fats just, they, that slows down the gastric emptying. So again, food isn't getting to the small intestine. And then all that fiber is like a gel around the small intestine that prevents sugar from getting into the bloodstream. We've got two mechanisms of slowing down the progression of food being broken down and entering into the bloodstream. So you have that ice cream or you have that piece of cake or whatever it is that you're loving. After that meal, you're going to blunt the response of that sugar because of the meal before that. And if you really want to nip it in the bud, then, then walk right after that dessert. So like the, the I, I would say the best time for dessert is you have lunch. It's a, it's a really healthy lunch. You have dessert and then you go for a walk. Like you probably won't spike at all. And that's really the name of the game. Yes, we could talk about the, the molecules of dessert and, and, and if it's a healthy dessert or not. But at the end of the day, if it's about stabilizing blood sugar and keeping your metabolism healthy, that's going to be the best time to do it. Um, okay, number four. I just have a question. What are yes. your favorite ways to, you know, a lot of people are like, I don't know, how do I get fiber in? But what are your favorite ways just to increase the fiber? Such a great question. Such a great question. So I, I one of the best ways I, I think is, is having, you know, stocking up on chia seeds, flax seeds, um, also basil seeds. So there's a lot of different sprouted, as well, sprouted veggies, and I sprinkle them onto salads. I sprinkle them on the food. I on my salmon today. I had a bunch of flax seeds and um, and chia seeds. I just kind of just did a sprinkle over that and my salad. So increasing that way, um, I think that's one of the best ways to get at the grocery store. At you can get some like just full on seed and flax um, crackers that, that don't even have any flowers in them. Like no, not even chickpea flour or, or rice flour or almond flour. They're just pure, um, pure seeds and like designed to boost fiber. Um, the other thing I'd recommend is again, having veggies at every single meal and then berries, you know, the highest fiber berry out there, right. Is, is raspberries. 
you know, get your fill of raspberries, of, of strawberries, of blueberries. So just if, if you're going to bring some sweetness in, berries are like in terms of their fiber to sweetness ratio, fiber wins when it comes to berries. So that's going to be some of my favorite ways to get. So we're just in, always integrating seeds and nuts and, and bulk into our meal as much as possible. Yeah, I love that. I live on, I, I have this, my refrigerator is huge things of seeds and I, I don't travel without chia seeds, quite honestly, because that's a breakfast and a crunch, you know, it really <laughs> throw, throw a couple of berries in and some water and chia and you're good to go. So those are great. Thank you. Okay, yeah. continue. continue. And we do green smoothies too. It's mostly protein, but we do veggies, um, obviously greens, chia seeds again, um, you know, just to get that bulk in, in, a, in a green smoothie. My, our toddler loves green smoothies too. We add a bone broth protein to it so we get that the protein, some avocado for the healthy fat and the fiber too. So we're, we're bulking on that fiber. So if it's easier for you, the one thing about making a smoothie though, it does pulverize some of that fiber, but not all of it. So you are still getting some of that benefit. Um, number four is to eat as early as possible. So I am a big fan of at least having a three hour break from your last meal before going to bed. One that allows for you to get really restorative sleep. Um, it allows for you to get that deep restful sleep. And it really allows your body to get out of the process of breaking down and metabolizing that meal so that you've got all the room for restoration and kind of just getting, you know, homeostasis when you're, when you're going to sleep. It's also phenomenal for our metabolism as well, because our mitochondria Chondria can take a break. Our cells can take a break. Everyone can, everyone can take a break. Um, and so I'm a big fan of a circadian fast where you, you stop dinner, let's say six o'clock or seven at the latest, and then you break that fast six or seven the next day. So you really give yourself an opportunity to be within that circadian rhythm and giving your mitochondria and your cells that opportunity to just rest and replenish and restore whatever they need to restore at night. Also helps to create more insulin sensitivity, helps to keep the blood sugar level stable, also helps to support metabolic flexibility as well. And you don't get into the place of like where it's too much fasting, you know, where it, it may stress the body out. Everybody's body's a little bit different, but I all feel that we can pull off a 12 hour circadian fast with that last meal in the evening being dinner on the earlier side, if you can do so. I, know, I don't know if you noticed when you're wearing your CGM, but I'll tell you what, I am so insulin resistant at night, so insulin resistant. And I've learned that the earlier I eat, I have a little bit more wiggle room. But really my body, my body's like, you can't have carbs in the evening time because I will, even if I've done well all day, my blood sugar is stable. It is quick to hike up because my body is like, we are done with activity for the day. We, we it's time for us to, to not leverage and utilize any more carb energy. <laughs> and so th that's just been my own personal experience. I find that when we eat earlier, there's just so many side benefits. You know, that's so interesting that you said that because... I, I was surprised because I eat so well and I, you know, all of a sudden I got my A1C and it was like the very lowest of pre-diabetic. I'm like, pre-diabetic? How's that possible? So that's when I decided to wear, you know, we had the constant glucose monitor for two weeks and exactly what you said. I learned fruit at night. I cannot have the carbs. I can't. And that would jack it up. And then what would happen is at night, it would go up and down and it would wake me up. It was really affecting my sleep. I had no idea that was the reason that I might've been waking up at night. But when I did exactly, exactly what you're saying at night, you know, reduce the carbs, have my meals early, have nothing. And I think that's something people, you know, people love that late night snack or whatever, even if it's a healthy snack, it just exactly what you said. I couldn't agree more. So once I changed that and I, I just don't have fruit at night, even fruit was, was jacking it up completely. Now my blood sugar is great, but it was, just, you know, that, that evening meal and afterwards and that fast makes such a big difference. So I love these tips that you're giving They're They're, they're not hard to implement and you know, they're really powerful and they're, that's what, that's what I really, you know, I love about your work is things are actionable and, and they are life changing because, you know, when you get that blood sugar stable, when you sleep, I mean, that's going to help everything, your bones, every part of your health is going to improve. Okay. Continue. There's one more. One more. And that is, you know, this is, this is more, this, again, this is truly a hack, but we do know two, two particular, um, 
supplements that we can take that can help stabilize. Because some of us, we're just going to need a little bit of help. Some of us have hyper and ins insulinemia that we're just going to have to address, you know, and, and it's going to require a little bit of extra support, like cutting out sugar entirely or cutting out fruit entirely in the evening, right? There's just going to be things that we're just going to have to, to do. Um, so one of my favorites is a, a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar in the morning before you start any meal, because it really sets the tone for your blood sugar. Um, and I recommend it um, in the morning, but then you could also use it. Let's say you decide you're going to have that chocolate cake and you're not going to wait till after a meal. You know, you're just going to do it. And, and you've made that decision. You're out with your bestie. You guys are like, you know what? That's your favorite little dessert place. You just walked by it. You know, at the very least, maybe walk after you have that dessert. But if you do apple cider vinegar, um, you know, five minutes prior to eating that chocolate cake or whatever that may be, or even 30 minutes, up to 30 minutes afterwards, you can blunt that blood sugar spike by 30 plus percent. The other thing that I really love is probably one of my favorite super supplements, which is berberine. So berberine, it, it's been shown in numerous research studies to be as efficient as metformin at helping to create more insulin sensitivity and blunt a blood sugar spike post meal. And I usually, it's around 500 milligrams is what we want to be taking. I also recommend berberine in the morning and then berberine right before dinner, just to help stabilize. If you find yourself, you're at that pre-diabetic stage, your hemoglobin A1C is 5.6 or 5.7. And you're just like, I need a little bit of support outside of the lifestyle techniques. Berberine may be a great option to help kind of curtail some of that. But what I've learned is that lifestyle, because it's literally what we're doing every single day is going to make the biggest difference. And then the, if I had a bonus, if I could just have a bonus um, outside of walking, my other favorite bonus is to do is, is some level of weight training, you know, three to four times a week, um, 20 to 30 minutes. You know, as we get, you know, as we get older, it's, you know, working out is a, a hormetic stressor, which is phenomenal for the body. But as, you know, especially if, we're, if I'm talking to women, we have a lot on our plates. We have a lot going on and our stress response system may already be a little bit activated. And sometimes any more then 30 minutes can, can start to work in the opposite direction, like running for an hour probably isn't going to get you the benefits that you're looking for. Um, it actually moves us in the direction of a stressor than it is actually helping our metabolic system. That's why I love weight training. So when I was pregnant, when I was postpartum after my pregnancy, um, today, literally I have Hajimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune disease. Like it, I, I, weights are the number one thing I'm doing. Um, not only is it the biggest bang for my buck in terms of building that muscle mass, um, and ensuring that I've got enough muscle to soak up that glucose and to keep my bones healthy, but also it is building my metabolic flexibility. And so if I had to choose an exercise, it is always going to be weight lifting weights. I aim for 20 to 30 minutes, four to five times a week. Personally, it could be three times a week, four times a week, but that is going to be the biggest bang for your buck. Um, outside of, of walking. So I do a combination of walking and a combination of lifting weights. I already lifted my weights today. Woo. Um, and I already did, I did some of my walking already as well. And I think that combination it just is, it feels good. Gets you, gets you, like the juice is worth the squeeze. And, you know, the walking, it, it, it's just, there's so many, there's so many benefits to it on top of emotional and mental well being. Wow, those are so great. In this population, everybody listening, we are very, very big into strength training and how powerful it is and that yes, walking can help, but it's certainly not enough. And when you really want to be empowered and when you're strong, you're empowered and you feel amazing. So those are really fabulous. Well, Dr. Marisa, you're doing something so incredible. I'm really excited for you to share about the summit that you're hosting because it, I just think it's fabulous. And there's so much information that people can learn from. So why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Absolutely. Well, it had been my experience. It's why I wrote my, my last book, my eighth book on menopause specifically. It had been my experience that women weren't feeling supported, it, especially in the, what I call the second puberty, the transition into menopause. But then after menopause, it was like, okay, you're there. Good luck. See you later. And that just wasn't good enough for me. And I knew that it wasn't good enough for any of us. And so I had, I've sought out some of the best experts out there, not only in the menopause, you know, our, our life in menopause and what that looks like and how we can support our brain health and our gut health and our 
bone health. Um, I have, you know, Dr. Dr. Northrup is on it. Dr. Perlmutter is on it, you know, to really speak into like, what do we do? And, and the, the big underlying message in all of it is any, any time is a good time. You, it is always a great time to really focus on your body, but there's a lot of things that we can consider, especially post-menopause that are really going to give us that vitality and that energy that we deserve because most of us are going to live decades, decades after we hit menopause. And for many of us, it's going to be, we're going to be living our best life in this time. And, you know, all the doctors, including myself, we want that life to be rich and to have, to have, you have strength and energy to just do whatever you want. I mean, my mom, she's, she's 63 years old. She'll be 64 this year. And, um, and she is going, she's running three marathons, three epic marathons in the month of October. She's going to Dublin, Ireland to run the big Dublin marathon. The next weekend she comes home, it's the New York marathon. And then she, she comes back here to Southern California and I forget what marathon she's running there, you know? And so not only is she running these marathons, but she is traveling halfway around the world to do some of them. You know, we live in California. And, you know, this is, this is, and she will be, it'll be the month that she turns 64. And she just, it's just what she does. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's just what, that is just a average October for my mother, you know, in the life that she's living. And so I, I just, I remember she didn't even start running until she was 50. She hadn't even like, I could outpace her, outrun her. And then she turned 50 and then she could kick my butt, and, you know? And so, you know, it just really opens the door for, she just decided one day. And so that's what the summit is about. It's like not only helping you to decide what it is that you want and then giving you the right tool sets because these experts, they know what it is to get your body healthy, to boost your metabolism, to consider hormone therapy, all of it, the whole kit and caboodle. Um, and it's all in this beautifully free summit um, where you just get to really cherry pick what you want to listen to, get what you need and begin to implement it. Oh. I love this. And so if for any, if people are listening after the summit or, you know, what else can, I know you have a special gift of recipes. That's yes. really exciting that I'm excited to try it. I'm going to go to the summit because it's there. you have so many good speakers and, you know, I'm a big believer in if you find even some little nuggets, they can be life-changing. So, life -changing. you know, I just, I'm a big summit person <laughs> and I, um, yeah, after hosting my own summit, it's just, so amazing when you can get all these people together and, and just have your, you know, it's like a smorgasbord, have your pick of what's interesting to you. So this sounds great. I'm so excited that you, because I know how much work it is that you, you know, did all this work and put this all together. But what, tell us about the recipes that you're sharing with us. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I can't share all these hacks about balancing <laughs> blood sugar and eating for your brain, your future brain health without providing recipes that are going to make a, just a huge difference. So this is my, it's a hormone recipe book, but it really focuses on balancing your blood sugar, which is probably one of the most critical hormones of all, insulin, um, supporting your gut microbiome and really supporting and loving up on your liver because your liver is, a. I mean, it's got a, such an intimate connection with glucose and glycogen and insulin that I want to make sure that all of those components, all of those systems of the body are working properly. So it's 14 recipes. They're super yummy, super easy to make. Um, it's I, that we make them all the time. Every week we're making these recipes ourselves in our home. And, and I knew that if, if we're doing them every day and they're, they're easy enough to do with a toddler, that it's they're, they're doable for most people. Oh, that's so great. Well, we'll have all the links to all of your things in the show notes. So any last minute things, this has been so great. And I can speak, and you, I have to say, I'm an energy person. You have the best positive energy. I just, I feel it through the screen. I'm in New Jersey. So it, it's really, it's really great. I just feel all this amazing positive energy. So it's, um, it's I mean, I think that's, it's so good. It, it, even gave me an extra boost. So thank you for that. But is there anything else that you want to share with anybody? Because these are, this has been so okay. fantastic. You know, I think about this, this, this time in our life, you know, as we, as we're stepping into just, if we're talking to women in particular past menopause, I think about like some of the, my, the women that have inspired me the most, like when they have done their biggest work or when they've really stepped into their power and, and taken ownership of, 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 of changing the world, you know, in a way that feels so authentic to them. And it's always been 
it's always women in our, our 50s or 60s or 70s and beyond. And so I, I just want to just speak into, you know, like just tap into that, tap into what, 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 what sets your soul on fire tap into that passion and then and then do things that nourish you so that you can let that that passion come through i think that's really to me that's that's the most important and and never let anyone gaslight you in the doctor's office and tell you or dismiss you that what you're feeling isn't true. I always recommend getting a second opinion. And, and, you know, there are such great practitioners out there and there's such great books out there as well that are really speaking to hearing you, you know, whatever you, whatever you're going through. So I don't ever want you to feel just because a doctor dismisses you or you, you have that type of experience that what you are experiencing isn't real. Um, you know, so often for us as women in our 40s, 50s, 60s and beyond, we're just, we're just dismissed as, oh, just lose weight or, oh, just, you're just stressed or just get more sleep. And um, that isn't always very helpful, um, you know, and, and especially when we're really expressing how we're feeling. And so I just want you to, to, um, to know that there's so many of us that hear you and feel you and see you um, and that are here to really offer the guidance that gets you to that place that you're just inspired and, and you're operating in that passion. Oh, I love that. Well, the links to your books as well. Thank you so much for sharing this and thank you for all the work you're doing and just making such a difference in the world. So thanks so much for being with us here today. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Dr. Marisa and now have some great tips that you can start right away to improve your metabolic health, improve your energy. And this will just help every aspect of your body, including your bones. So I'm so excited for everything she talked about. This summit sounds amazing, as well as all the resources that she's giving us. So everything will be in the show notes. And thank you so much for tuning in. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.